In his final days, Alexander the Great's generals asked him who should succeed him. Alexander's answer, the strongest. Taken literally, this would see the close of the classical Greek age, an age thousands of years in the making. Join me, Mark Selleck, as I go back to retell the story of ancient Greece in my series Casting Through Ancient Greece. We will cast our way back to its beginnings, all the way through to the spread of its culture throughout the known world, thanks to Alexander and his generals. You can listen and subscribe to the series at www.castingthroughancientgreece.com or you can listen on your favourite podcasting platform. Don't forget to follow the series over on Twitter at Casting Greece or on Facebook at Casting Through Ancient Greece. I look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to the History of European Theatre Podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 24, Greek Conclusions, Part 2. Last time, I started my conclusion to Season 1 of the History of European Theatre Podcast, The Ancient Greek Theatre. If by any chance you've not listened to that episode yet, you could listen to this as a standalone episode, but honestly, it'll make much more sense if you listen to Part 1, and indeed, all of the episodes in Season 1, before you do that. In this episode, I'm going to pick up on three areas of ancient Greek drama where I think what I already covered in the podcast episodes needs a bit of further detail. Masks, the theatre buildings and the audience. But first, there's an addition I need to make to the first conclusion episode. In tracing the history of how Greek texts made it through to the centuries, I said that after the fall of Constantinople, the texts survived through monasteries in southern Italy. Which is true, but it's not the full story. I should also have acknowledged that many texts were saved in the Arab world. Cities like Marrakesh and Timbuktu and others had large libraries that preserved Greek, Arab and Roman texts and were an invaluable source in the Reformation period as part of the way the Greek writers were reintroduced to Europe. For balance, it's important that we recognise that source and the debt Western culture owes to the Arab and Muslim world for their role in preserving the literature. If there was one area of Greek drama that I knew most listeners would be aware of before listening to the podcast, it was the use of masks. And it was a subject that seemed to take on increased relevance as we began the adopting of masks to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. The enforced mask quickly became a method of individual expression, but also something that many of us in the Western culture were quite uncomfortable with. Generally speaking, we're not used to mask wearing and felt the restriction of expression that having half the face covered entails. It certainly put the fixed full mask used in the ancient Greek theatre into a new perspective. Although I mentioned the use of mask in some detail and how they looked and worked during the early episodes of the podcast, with hindsight, I don't think I did the subject justice. The reasons for using mask and the way mask developed out of the religious tradition is, I think, well understood and described. See episodes one to three of the podcast. A mask is a key element for a priest or shaman taking on the persona of a god or becoming the channel for the god. But when the mask becomes used in performance, it not only continues in that vein with the shortcut to becoming a character, but also draws attention to other aspects of performance, such as the use of voice, hands, arms and body movement generally. Practitioners who have used mask in productions of Greek plays speak to the effect that however fixed the mask is, the difference in characters is not just defined by the mask but by the entire movement of the actor. So two actors masked and costumed in the same way can still give different performances. Don a mask and you become a performer. Regardless of the context and whoever your audience, ideally they would be able to get past the fixed aspect of the mask and see more deeply into the performance. So in the large auditoria, the mask can enhance the complete performance, which is something that seems quite counterintuitive. It's speculated that this is a reflection of the very ancient use of mask. The oldest masks ever discovered have been dated to about 11,000 years ago. These are made of deer skulls that were fashioned to fit the human head, so the top half of the face is covered and some of the deer antlers is retained not so far from the image that we have of Dionysus thousands of years later. These masks were found in Yorkshire, northern England, and the dating puts them close to the end of the last ice age, when very early man had just survived and was beginning the recolonisation of Europe. 
with the mask developing to represent the healer, the traveller between worlds, superhuman strength and, in death, the last face that the wealthy and revered presented to the world. It's not surprising that mask resonates with us all, even if we don't really quite realise why. I think that for the ancient Greeks, the use of mask in theatre was a natural enabler, that enhanced performance, and for all the stylization of movement that the use of mask demanded, it also enhanced the overall performance for the large outdoor stage, while still resonating deeply on a cultural level. Which brings me to the significant impact that theatre buildings themselves had on the plays. In the early episodes of the podcast, I described the experience of being at the theatre and the way the stage and the audience seating was arranged. That configuration changed little through the whole period. In Athens, theatres went through periods of repair and improvement, but had fixed points like the shrine at the Linnea or the altar at the Dionysia, and later, solid stone for the Skene and sections of the auditorium, which kept them essentially unchanged for long periods of time. But there were some changes over time. With the decline in the importance and size of the chorus, the orchestra area became reduced by narrowing. It was this reduction that allowed the auditorium capacity to be increased. Conversely, the skene grew from the single storey to two levels and became more and more ornamental. By the 4th century BCE, the large casts of extras and dancers involving casual or amateur performers were in decline and Athens was no longer the innovator of design. However, the audience capacity was still large, between 15 and 20,000 in the mid-300s BCE, at which time the statues of the great poets were added in a prominent position by the entrance. The theatre complex went through several minor redesigns and then in the 1st century CE the stage was extended over the orchestra to allow for the by then more popular entertainments of gladiatorial fights and animal baiting to take place more easily. In the 4th century CE the remaining orchestra was walled in to allow for the staged sea battles that were by then the entertainment of choice. The Athenian theatres are not the only examples that we have. If you travel west from Athens across the Isthmus of Corinth and follow the coast of Attica south, it's a journey of less than 100 miles to get to Epidurus. The theatre here was different from the Theatre of Dionysus in that it was purpose-built in stone rather than being developed on from earlier wooden versions. It can be seen today as a fine example, perhaps the finest example, of the ancient Greek theatre, and much of our understanding of how the Greek theatre worked is based on work done at this site, both archaeologically and in terms of performance. It is a huge theatre, seating up to 14,000 people, and nearly all of the seating is in its original position. As a theatre, it works perfectly thanks to its carefully designed proportions. Studies show that all the measurements are derived from the cubit, the unit of measurement based on the length of the lower human arm. This is the basis of a measurement of a stone at the centre of the orchestra, and every other measurement in the theatre is a multiple of this. That geometry, this fundamental to the whole building, meant that in the Greek mind the building was an extension of the human body, which itself was a microcosm of the universe. This gave the site a specific religious significance, and it may have been linked to the sanctuary of the god Asclepius, the god of healing, which is located nearby. The geometry also gives it an aesthetically pleasing and practical shell-like shape, both from an acoustic point of view and in the way the attention becomes naturally focused on the centre spot of the orchestra, thanks to the curve of the seating. Again, we see that sense of inclusivity that the Greek theatre promotes despite its large size. This works both ways. The actors cannot look away from the audience other than by turning their backs to them, and you'll remember that with the mask tradition, this is the least likely stance for an actor to adopt, unless exiting the stage. Exactly how the actor would feed off that energy from the audience and use it is a matter for speculation, but there was certainly a unification of actor, chorus and audience that has not been present in the theatrical experience since theatre went indoors and started seating audiences face-on and in the dark. The theatre we see today at Epidurus is from the 2nd century BCE, where an upper tier of seating was added to increase capacity. The original seating, running up from the perfectly round orchestra, is divided into 12 wedges, with staircase dividing each wedge. The additional seating was divided from the original by a broad horizontal passageway, above which a further 20 or so rows of seating were added. 
This section is divided into 22 wedges by staircases. As the wedges get wider as you go up the structure, presumably entrance and exit congestion would have become an issue for the audience without these additional access points. The altar is no longer present and only the foundation to the skene behind the orchestra remain. The acoustics are said to be perfect, with even quiet sounds made at the centre spot of the orchestra being clearly audible at the very back and top of the seating. An older and far less well-preserved theatre is east of Athens, on the coast, in what was the city deem of Thorikos. This theatre was built in the early 5th century BCE, so gives a good idea of what the earliest theatres were like. The orchestra is more of a rectangle with curved short ends than a circle, and the altar is off-centre, making the whole structure an asymmetrical one. It's a good example of how the builders of theatres had to work with the natural features they were given. It would never be possible to make a standard theatre design in the modern sense, where a design can be reused in different locations, as the building depended on the natural bowl and other features in the landscape, and ideally locally available building materials. Some carving out of the stone was of course possible, but craftsmen and architects were adept at using natural features to their best possibilities. In the case of Thorikos, it's thought that the original theatre was relatively small, with audience capacity being increased to about 6,000 by the addition of higher seating at a later date. Throughout the podcast, you will have already noticed the frequent mention of Syracuse. Located on the southeast coast of Sicily, the town rivalled Athens in wealth and was the home of a deep well of creative talent. It had a theatre from very early times, which was rebuilt on several occasions. The version built in 230 BCE could seat an audience of up to 15,000 people. It was built to impress. In this case, rock was quarried to expand the bowl of the original theatre, a feat of engineering and effort in itself, and the skene was made two storeys high. There was even a covered portico to offer some protection from the elements for some sections of the audience. Although we can only now see the ruins of the orchestra and skene, and much of the auditorium is in a bad state, the site is still impressive for its scale and deservedly a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Some very interesting work on analysing the acoustics of Greek theatres has been done in recent years. It's long been held that acoustics in these ancient theatres are some of the best created. In the purpose-built theatres, a coin dropped at the centre of the orchestra can be clearly heard in the back row, maybe up to 100 metres away, in the largest theatre. This may not be true of the Theatre of Dionysus that was much added to and developed over the years, having grown out of the very earliest gathering place in the shadow of the Acropolis. But purpose-built theatres in later years were built, it seemed, with an understanding of how sound behaves. The quality of the acoustics cannot be absolutely proved in a ruined theatre, as it doesn't reflect sound in the same way that a complete one would. The materials used in construction have a significant effect and even the most complete surviving examples have, for example, marble facings missing, if not more significant misshapings caused by partial collapses, theft of materials or repairs. All of which means it's difficult to absolutely replicate the original behaviour of sound generated from the stage or the orchestra. Indeed, even just an empty theatre doesn't reflect sound in the same way that a full one does. A mass of human bodies absorb some of the sound and change the shape of the auditorium, thereby changing the acoustic. Studies conducted during modern performances at sites such as Epidurus in the empty auditoria and by computer modelling can't tell us who first realised that a speaker standing at the base of a natural bowl in the landscape could be heard by a large crowd and that the acoustic improved if the area was cleared of any other objects so the audience had a clear line of sight to the speaker. We can't say who first worked out that the audience furthest from the speaker needed to be sat on a steeper slope than those nearer the front, but what the studies do show is that this shape is near perfect for the acoustics, and those calculations appear to have been taken into account, the effect of the presence of the audience themselves. Even the orchestra area has an improving effect on the acoustics, as it places the audience at some minimum distance from the sound source meaning that all the audience are sitting in the area of reflected sound rather than hearing the actors and singers and chanters directly. This is sound reflected off the skene behind, the flat surface of the orchestra itself, and from the increasingly steep sides of the auditorium. In this configuration, every audience member has a good chance of hearing clearly. <laughs>
there's evidence that there was concern about audibility in the theatre. Vitruvius was an architect and civil engineer working in the 1st century BCE who theorised about placing resonating vases in the theatre as a form of amplification. His treatise is probably speculative rather than a practical suggestion, but it shows that there was active thinking around the subject even later in the period. Of course we know that performance depended on the strong voice from the actor. We have the story of Sophocles having to give up acting because despite all his other charismatic talents, his voice was too high and weak to be heard clearly. Such demands on the actor may be one of the original reasons why acting was a male profession, and none of this answers the debate about if masks had some sort of amplification tool built in or not, but it does, I think, reinforce the notion that the theatre was not only a place of seeing, but a place of hearing too. This was not just for plays, religious ceremonies and other entertainments, but for participation in democracy. The very conical shape of the theatre, where the entire voting population could be addressed as one and be very aware of the presence of all of the other participants, was a significant tool in promoting the concept of inclusivity in early democracy. From the examples like Syracuse, Thoricos and Epidurus, and from archaeological evidence throughout the region, we can see that theatre did exist and indeed thrive outside Athens and the Dionysia and Linnea festivals. Many towns had their own theatres, some of which were large affairs. Although the majority were left to ruin, became built over or buried, and in many cases the stone reused for other purposes over the centuries, we still have enough evidence and the odd gem in a better state of preservation to see that they not only fulfilled the theatrical need, but were also used for town meetings and other activities. Many, as in Athens, were part of a religious complex which no doubt had a significant effect on their use, particularly in the early period. Even today, with building works in Athens and other parts of Greece, new sites are uncovered and help give us new insights into how they worked as functioning buildings and places of performance. Today, and going back a long way, we never really experienced the theatre like the ancient Greeks did. The vast majority of what we see was written for and is presented in some form of closed stage area, typically the proscenium arch stage, where we see actors performing as if a fourth wall has been removed. The division between stage and audience has never been more distinct, and breaking that divide is often used as a shock tactic from an audience perspective. In modern theatre, the general rule for actors is that an intense scene should be played in the downstage area, closer to the audience. The Greek theatre was completely different, with upstage being the strong position, and that difference is driven by the dynamics of the playing area. Sitting in the auditorium, every audience member has a clear line of sight to the orchestra and over the heads of the chorus to the stage area and the actors in front of the skene, and to the theologian above. Beyond that, there is a view of the landscape beyond. In the case of Athens, this is out to the surrounding temples, the hillside and the sea in the distance. As we've seen, the plays are usually set outside, with interior scenes only being reported on stage. With the arrangement of the acting area behind the orchestra and with the wrapped-around audience in the auditorium starting from a position level with the orchestra, the audience would have been much more visible to each other than in the typical modern indoor theatre. Where 15 to 20,000 people all focus on one spot, one performance, they may be a long way off, but they are still part of a single crowd who may be sometimes, get that cathartic experience that brings them together as a community. It's unlike the experience we have today, but let's not suggest that the audience sat there with rapt attention all of the time. I would guess that there was constant movement in such a large crowd, with people chatting to close neighbours, eating, selling food and drink, and maybe other trinkets related to the festivals. These were holidays, so presumably the mood was light, at least until the religious ceremonies and then the tragedies got underway, and then some concentration and respect would probably be expected. For attendance at a comedy, perhaps the mood was lighter throughout, particularly in the later period, but my point is that this experience was not like the modern theatrical one, because it was a big stadium experience. Other factors to remember are that the festivals were not frequent events, so must have generated much excitement and expectation as they drew closer, and that the plays were in competition and audiences were very vocal in their support for or dislike of a play. Perhaps in our day, a large sports event is the closest comparison, but really, I don't think we have anything to compare too closely.
I think that even at an outdoor performance in a theatre similar to a Greek model, it's not the same experience, because we don't have the same deep-seated connection to the art, because it's become secular. Theatre was important to the Athenians in a way we can only barely imagine, evidenced by the fact that it was maintained through the worst of times. When the Spartan forces were at the gates, even after they had taken the city, the festivals continued. Democracy was put into decline, but theatre survived. As a final part of this summing up, I wanted to take another look at the idea of Athens as a whole in the ancient world. When we look back at this period of human development and see Athens as the shining beacon of civilization, it's all too easy to wax lyrical about the greatness of the city, and I think I stand guilty as charged in that respect. That's not to say that Athens wasn't all of these things, and we rightly trace the beginnings of culture, science, art and politics that we recognise today, in the West, to this time and place. But there was a darker side that we shouldn't forget. Athens, like most of the ancient world, was a slave society with an economy that depended on slavery as much as the Romans and the Vikings did. It's estimated that there were 80,000 slaves in Athens in the 5th century BCE, where the city population was around 200,000. Slavery was generally accepted, notably by Aristotle, who thought it perfectly natural. But it was questioned in the Socratic debates and particularly by the Stoic philosophical movement. There are also reports that slaves in Athens were generally treated better than in other city-states. The Spartans are noted for being particularly cruel to their slaves. But, still, a slave is a slave, and being well-treated or almost indistinguishable from a freeman in Athens may not have been much consolation. Slaves were prizes of war or simply a saleable commodity. These were people who, for one reason or another, had been ripped from their hometown and people and put to work with no real hope of advancement. Most slaves were used in physical work, and life in the fields was hard. Life in the quarry was hard. Life in the silver mines was hard, virtually a death sentence. Athens may have enjoyed a benign climate that made life easier for them than most of the rest of Europe, but for the majority it was still a case of subsistence farming in the service of a landowner who did much better out of it than you did. So, to redress the balance, I think we have to remember that yes, life was probably better for many than in other parts of Europe at the time, but there were still huge disparities in society, where many lost out or could never hope of getting a foothold. Just because you could vote didn't mean you always had a full belly, leisure time to do what you wanted with, or that you were safe from disease taking you off very suddenly. And given the almost constant state of war, for the young men of Athens, there was always the chance of a foreigner's spear being thrust through you before you realised it. Our sources are mostly educated rich men, the elite of society, so it's their view that we get. Even the playwrights themselves often came from the wealthy or priestly citizens who could devote their time to participation in democracy. That democracy, important to us as it is, was nowhere near complete with women, foreign residents and slaves excluded, even in the most democratic periods, only about 25% of the population were eligible to vote. And of these, as a much smaller number could take time off working the fields or from their trade to participate. So it was all still elitist, even if it was in principle somewhat inclusive. Yes, let's praise Athens as the birthplace of democracy, philosophy, art, sculpture, the legal system and, of course, plays in the theatre. But let's not forget the darker side of life too. And some thoughts back on theatre to round off. I was asked if I had a favourite Greek play and it's a question that I found surprisingly easy to answer. Just from the point of view of enjoyment of a theatrical piece, and outside of whatever influence they've had, uh, I think the tragedies stand out. The comedies are harder to engage with and understand because of their local and historically specific references, and the humour is not always obvious. The plays work with a part of the ancient Greek character that enjoyed base comedy and slapstick, and I think on the whole, our tastes have become more sophisticated, or at least more diverse. So for me, the tragedies resonate more, and I think that is particularly because they deal with the foundation myths of Western culture, and fundamental questions of how the individual and then the family unit should behave in society. These are questions that every generation asks, albeit we ask them in different ways. And of the tragedies, like many before me, I think Agamemnon is the best. 
As great as they are, and there are many things to like in them, I can't quite get myself to enjoy Euripides' plays in the same way, and Sophocles is a bit too fatalistic and contrived for my tastes. But Agamemnon, I think, works best on a theatrical level as a complete piece. The introduction by The Watchman, the descriptive poetry of the march of the beacons across Attica, and the life of the hoplite, the drama of the standoff between Agamemnon, Clytemnestra, and Aegisthus, and the entrance of Agamemnon and his progression over the crimson carpet to his death are wonderfully crafted scenes, and for me make the play both moving and thought-provoking in the same moment. The high point has to be Agamemnon's slow, barefooted walk to his death over the priceless crimson tapestries that cause his feet to become as if soaked in blood. Clytemnestra watches from the strong, upstage position in front of the doors of the Skene. Cassandra watches from behind, part of his ostentatiously wealthy caravan of war booty, registering the danger, but as yet unable to see it clearly enough to do anything about it. This is storytelling through imagery at its finest. I hope I'm not wrong in thinking that the audience would have absolutely understood what was going on here. What Aeschylus was saying to them about their way of life, the danger of hubris and absolute power, and how precious their new freedoms were. It may be one of the earliest spectacular theatrical set pieces we know of, but in my view it's still one of the best ever created. I could pick outstanding moments from other plays for honourable mention. The final realisation by Oedipus of his situation in the Sophocles version the burning of the thinkery in the clouds, the appearance of the ghost of Darius in the Persians, and Agave carrying the head of her son Pentheus, oblivious to what she'd done. But for the best complete play, Agamemnon is the one that I want to see, even if it means getting up early and sitting on a stone seat before dawn. Ancient Athenian drama, with its roots in religion, the foundation myths of the gods and the Homeric epic, transported the people to a place where they could look at their leaders, their enemies and their fellow citizens. It was a place where questions were asked and answers offered. Poets with a particular viewpoint presented their worldview and set out the challenges as they saw them. In a tradition that started long ago, they presented these questions as stories, where the audience were taken with the protagonists and the antagonists through experiences that changed them and presented a result, a result that hit home on an emotional level as much as on an intellectual one. Tragedy was one route, comedy another, and both involved a fair share of fantasy, imagination and ingenuity. But at the end of the day, it comes down to telling a good story something we've been doing ever since in the place we call theatre. And perhaps the very final word should be about the playwrights. Immortality is bestowed on a few, and the Athenians have more than their fair share. But the three tragedians deserve their place, and on a good day I'll include Aristophanes and even Menander in that too. There's a nice story in Plato's Symposium. It's probably one of those Greek stories we have to not completely trust, but Plato tells how Socrates suggests to Aristophanes and Agathon, a prize-winning tragedian of the time, that the comic and tragic forms should be combined to make one dramatic art form. He argues that it should be possible for the tragic and comic poet to coexist in one person, and this would produce the most sublime works. The discussion is long and ultimately unresolved. As dawn breaks, the playwrights succumb to sleep, as Socrates is left with no one to debate with. But satisfyingly, we know he was right, and that such a combination was possible, and when it did happen, it did produce works of unparalleled quality. It just took us another 18 or so centuries to get there. Next time, we move on to the Romans. To facilitate this and get some more reading under my belt, I'm going to pause the podcast for a short time and return refreshed for Season 2. In the meantime, please keep up to date by liking the Facebook page for the podcast and joining us on Twitter or YouTube. All episodes so far are now posted there, and I'll keep them up to date as we go forward. As you've made it through Season 1 with me, please celebrate by adding a review to whichever service you use. It really does help other people find us, and it's definitely a case of the more the merrier. And if there's anything Greek that you would like to know more about, or think I missed out completely, please let me know, and maybe we'll be able to take time out in the future to dip back into the fascinating world of theatre in ancient Athens.
If your appreciation of the podcast goes a little bit further than just a review, I now have a page on Kofi.com where you can tip me the price of a coffee, as and when you feel inclined. Copious amounts of coffee are consumed during the research and recording periods, so that particular token of appreciation would be very gratefully received. I've included the link there in the show notes. As you know, the podcast is now on YouTube, as well as all other podcast apps, and the Amazon Music app now carries podcasts. So if you've updated to the latest version of the Amazon Music app, you can now listen to the podcast there and on your smart speaker. Plenty to keep you entertained, I hope, while I take a short break. Thanks again for coming with me all this way, and I look forward to your company next time for the start of Season 2. But if you do have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can, as usual, contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.com.